are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Worship at St. Thomas. I'd like to invite you to stand with us. Good morning and welcome to worship. It is uh, good to be here. I invite those who are gathered here to be seated. We welcome those who are watching us online. We are also blessed and glad that you are with us on this 
third Sunday in Advent as we make our way towards the birth of Christ at Christmas. Uh, we light the pink candle today, which is a candle specifically of joy, um, finding joy in this season. And today we're going to talk about Emmanuel, God with us, which does bring our joy to uh, everyday life. So as we make our way through our Advent season, we are looking at the book um, Incarnation by Adam Hamilton and have several different ways that we are doing that. Hopefully on the screen you'll see on our, uh, our uh, slides we are talking about our sermon series that we're making our way through on Sundays. Also, we continue our Wednesday. Wednesday evening worship services, which you're all invited to, 7 o'clock, where we will be uh, doing Hold an Evening Prayer is the liturgy, the service, which is beautiful music that that is. Um, and this upcoming week, I'd like to highlight that our prayers and our liturgy are going to be aimed um, towards celebrating what's called the Blue Christmas, um, which goes towards the, the longest night of the year service, uh, December 21st, we know is the winter solstice. We're all talking about the stars that are going to be aligning on that day and how, how exciting that might be to see something like the Christmas star in our time. But we also know that this time is a difficult time for many, even uh, pandemic aside um, on top of that, but also a time of grief, a time of loss, a time of darkness that is highlighted at this time of year when we are um, trying to be all full of, uh, full of joy and celebration. So we honor the fact that it is difficult for many people and um, look as we gather to celebrate our blue Christmas to see that that is not the last word. We honor that, um, honor that dark time and the hardship, but also um, celebrate the light that comes into the darkness in the form of Jesus, the Christ who will be born into our world and focus then on the light that is coming into our darkness. So if that will speak to you or anyone that uh, you know, particularly in this time, we welcome you to come to worship on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock as we uh, celebrate a blue Christmas service that night. Um, otherwise, uh, I believe we have lots of um, things that are coming up in terms of our Christmas Eve celebration. So before we get to Christmas Eve, we have the Christmas program, of course. Our Sunday school kids have been working hard at uh, learning their lines and recording themselves for a new script that we have this year. In current uh, light of current times, it's going to be a Zoom Christmas. So the way we're going um, to watch this and enjoy this as a congregation is not to go on Zoom, but we're going to go to our computers and and turn on YouTube. If we want to do this all together on Saturday night at 5 o'clock, as if we're at the program together, that would be a, a wonderful way for us to focus our time on Saturday evening at 5. And then we will uh, go to, there's a link on the screen, you'll also be on our website, that you can watch uh, the, the children tell their form a version of the Christmas story in their modern fashion today and celebrate with them um, in their own words and their own presence how Christ is born into our world this year. So that's this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock on the 19th. The video will be posted online after that, so if you're not able at that time, you can watch it certainly afterwards as well. And then, um, speaking of Christmas Eve services, we will be gathering at 3, at 5.30, and at 11. We do have three in-person worship options for us on Christmas Eve, but also the 3 and the 5.30 are going to be live streamed. So for those of you who would like to rather join us or able to join us um, online, we're going to welcome you to do that as well. Um, we do ask if you come in person that you do sign up on the website so that we can uh, make sure we have enough space uh, for everyone and we have all our protocols, of course, will be in place for our in-person worship. But but we look forward to celebrate um, the birth of Christ with you on Christmas Eve and um, are thankful for the opportunity to do that in multiple ways so that we can gather, if not physically, in spirit as a congregation um, to welcome Christ as he comes. So, throughout the course of this Advent time in preparation for Christmas, we do continue to give ourselves away. And I'm going to give a shout out to Sophie Mulder if you're watching us today. Way to go. Congratulations for your family and friends. We're thankful for your spirit of generosity that has collected, I believe it's 467 pairs of socks uh, for Douglas County Health uh, Hospital, as well as all the others that are gathered from our congregation and a bunch of uh, pop as we have finished our pop and socks drive winds up today. And we we will pass those gifts and treats along to the residents of Douglas County Health that they might know that they are in our thoughts and prayers during this holiday season. Also, thank you to those who have responded to our Drive for Lutheran Family Services for the foster families. We have collected, um, we'll give a final tally at some point, but well over $3,000, I believe, of gift cards and then also gifts in kind that are coming through the congregation to our foster families. So that drive also ends up today. So if you have taken or signed up for on our website, um, a family or um, a child, then we ask that you get those gifts to us um, either uh, today or could possibly squeeze it in uh, tomorrow morning. We are thankful for those gifts that we can get them in time for the families to celebrate Christmas. 
So we're thankful for that opportunity to give ourselves away and uh, to share the light of Christ in that way into our community, but also that the light shines on us as we are gathered for worship today. So uh, with that, I'm going to invite the congregation to stand as we turn and offer the light of Christ in the form of the peace that we pass with one another as we welcome them to the worship. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of smile and high five or a, a sign of peace, Christ's peace among us. <laughs> Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Let us pray. O oh God, how grateful we are that you came to us in Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel. You understand our humanity, our fears, our weaknesses, our succumbing to sin, and those moments when we are less than what you wish us to be. You understand our struggle with grief and death. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in Jesus, that we might know who you are and walk with you all of our days. Lord, use us to be Emmanuel for those who do not know you. Help us incarnate your love and grace to all that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, bless it. Your 
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, the first chapter, beginning with the first verse. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel lesson for this morning comes from the first chapter of Matthew's gospel, beginning with the 20th verse. But just when Joseph had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Congregation, please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our living Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. Well, as we've said, we're going through the, uh, the Incarnation series uh, this Advent season, and so I'll give you a small little recap of where we have been. The first week we talked about Jesus um, and the name's Messiah, the Hebrew version of Christ, um, in the Greek of the word of uh, the anointed one, the king, as Jesus comes to us as the anointed king of all creation. Week two, last week, Pastor David preached about Jesus as Savior, the one who saves us from our sins, saves us for life of salvation and goodness in the world. And today we're going to talk about Emmanuel, Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. So as familiar as you might be with the name and word Emmanuel, believe it or not, Emmanuel only shows up in Scripture three different times in the Bible. Twice in Isaiah and once in Matthew in the Gospel reading for today, where Matthew is quoting back from Isaiah. So for those of you who have maybe noticed, there are two different ways to spell Emmanuel, uh, one with an I and one with an E. It's not just a typo or a a competition between one or the other, which is right. There's good reason for the two different versions being valid. I, Emmanuel with an I, comes from the Hebrew version of the name, and the Emmanuel with the E comes from the Greek version, the version used in the New Testament. So you'll notice, um, even on the screen, there are two different versions today. But in order to understand what the biblical writers of both the Old Testament and the New Testament who used this name Emmanuel were talking about, let's go back to Isaiah and look at the context where this name first appears. In Old Testament times, uh, the times after King Saul, David, and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel divided in two. So think of about civil war, where one nation uh, divides into two. And there became a northern kingdom, which is the area... Whoops. Here we go. Or maybe not. There we go on the map. The area in pink, thank you, uh, is uh, the northern kingdom, also known as Samaria or Israel. Sometimes instead of the whole country, it's the northern kingdoms known as Israel. Or Ephraim is another name. There are several names for this northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom, which I think is in green, um, is called Judah. Um, It has a couple different territories, but Judah is the largest and the most dominant of them, the territory in the region. And Judah is where the city of Jerusalem is located, which we know is important for much of the biblical story. So by the time of Isaiah, the kingdom of Israel as a whole had been divided in two for almost 200 years. And despite their differences, these two regions still had many things in common, including, of course, their shared history, some language, their religion and culture. Sometimes they united to fight common enemies, and sometimes they fought against each other. Well, around the year 735 B.C., the northern kingdom formed an alliance with the kingdom of Aram, which is located just at the top of that pink section, um, an alliance to help fight off Uh, the Assyrians, the mighty Assyrian nation that was threatening them from the east. Now, in order to do this, to fight off Assyria, they also needed Judah's support. So they went to King Ahaz and asked if he would join their coalition. 
And King Ahab said no. And because of this, the kings of Aram and Israel then tried to kill Ahaz to put in a new king sympathetic to their cause on the throne. Well, Ahaz found out about this plot against his life, and he was terrified. In the midst of Ahaz's fear, God told the prophet Isaiah to go to Ahaz and say, and this is in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, Take heed, Isaiah or Ahaz, be quiet, do not fear. Do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, the two kings to the north. God promised that the harm they were planning against Ahaz would not happen as long as Ahaz stood firm in his faith. God then offered to give Ahaz a sign that what God promised would indeed come true. Now, I don't know about you, but I take a step back and say, wow, wouldn't that be great to have a tangible sign from God that everything is going to be okay? Well, if you can imagine, Ahaz refused to even ask for a sign from God. God insisted, however, and said again through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. So the young woman that Isaiah was referring to could have been one of the king's wives or perhaps a new wife of Isaiah. We don't know exactly who she was, just that she became pregnant and her child would be a visible reminder of God's promise to end the threat against Ahaz. Well, in the year 722 B.C., when the child would have been about 10 or 11 years old, the Assyrians indeed march on and into the northern kingdom to take it over and to destroy it. They took the people who survived into exile. In 720, a couple years later, Aram also was destroyed, and, w- and in the process then, this prophecy was fulfilled. What's important to know is that Isaiah prophesied in a specific place and time. When he spoke, he had no idea that there would be a Jesus coming about 700 years later. Our Jewish brothers and sisters would say that the prophecy is fulfilled in the birth of the child in Isaiah's time, which was true and still is true today. As Christians, we don't deny this, but we take a longer, larger arc of history and look at this story and all of the prophets' writings to say that perhaps there was something bigger going on. Perhaps God was planting seeds for what Emmanuel with an E, God with us, would mean. God was doing something bigger for the salvation of the world that would lead to the birth of Jesus, the Savior and Messiah, God in the flesh. What our our incarnation really means for us today, how exactly Jesus could be truly divine and truly human at the same time, has been debated by the church ever since the church began, and it remains a mystery. What we do know is not true about this is that not that he was not human, that he just looked human or maybe appeared human, but didn't really lower himself to be less than divine, potentially compromising his divinity by becoming human. We know that that's not true. We also know that he was not just a human being that had some kind of divine spirit infuse itself in him, making him wise and able to perform miracles, though he essentially was just a man. No, he was fully God and fully human. Philippians chapter 2 describes it this way, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited for himself, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How Jesus actually became God in human flesh will remain a mystery, I suspect, until the end of time. 
But here's what we do know, is that the incarnation of Jesus shows us three important things about God. First of all, that God knows and understands us because he has walked in our shoes. God knows what it's like to be part of a family and a community with all of its joys and all of its frustrations. We don't talk very much about it, but surely he laughed from time to time, especially as he was among the children and blessing them. He likely enjoyed traveling with his disciples and his other supporters, sharing conversations and joking with them as they walked along the beaten paths from town to town. He knows what it felt like to be hungry, to be tempted, to be physically exhausted. He felt grief on the death of a beloved friend. He cried, he bled, he got angry, he knew fear and worry. He was betrayed by his friends, those closest to him, when he he needed them the most. He forgave, he prayed, and he took time for rest. God knows what we experience as humans because Jesus experienced himself when we lived here on earth as one of us. The next thing uh, Jesus' incarnation shows us about God is that Jesus shows us what God looks like. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world's He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. God knows of our need to be able to see things in order to believe or understand, much less follow. So God sent Jesus so that we could know what God looks like in the flesh, and therefore have a better idea of what living in God's covenant of love and promise of hope looks like for us here. It looks like the one who taught us not to turn in on ourselves, but instead to turn outward and love our neighbors. God looks like Jesus, the miracle worker, who performed miracles that point us to God's desire for our healing and wholeness and restoration. God looks like the one through whom the powers of forgiveness and resurrection demonstrate for us God's desire and uh, God's power and insistence that death and, re- and resurrection, death and evil and sin are not the last word on our lives or the life of our world. Jesus is what God looks like in the flesh. And finally, Jesus reminds us that God is always with us. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus speaks to his disciples just after his resurrection, speaking to them, those who were gathered in belief of him as the risen Christ, and those who also were doubting. And to all of them, Jesus said, remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus reminds us that God is with us because God is always faithful. God's presence does not depend on our faith or belief, our action or inaction. God's presence with us depends solely on God and God's promise to be faithful to us through thick and thin, even to the end of the age. So if Emmanuel is God with us, then where is God in the midst of this pandemic today? I'm sure there are many people, maybe even some of us here, who have asked that same question. And first, let me say that God did not send this pandemic to teach us a lesson or to punish us for something. Yes, there were pandemics in the Old Testament known as plagues and pestilence that Old Testament people understood as God's judgment and punishment on their sin. We now know that there are scientifically understood causes for plague and illness that we can explain and, God willing, control through vaccines and medication. 
One of the ways that God is with us in this pandemic is in the inspiration and persistence of scientists and researchers as they make headway and have found a way to develop vaccines that will work to combat the virus. God is in the people and systems preparing to distribute these vaccines so that we can begin to heal and live in freedom from fear and frustration. Of course, God is in the healthcare workers who continue to lift up and honor for their valiant and heroic ways they have stepped in in order to care for others, even when it meant putting themselves or their families in harm's way. I recently spoke with a chaplain who serves at Lakeside Hospital here in our neighborhood who talked about the countless medical staff who continue to work tirelessly for their patients and their patients' families even while experiencing loss and tragedies of their own. God is with us in the midst of all of it. I like this particular slide, this image, because to me it shows how the light of Christ reaches down to our world, meeting us specifically right where we are in everyday life. The light of God with us refills our cup of energy when we are done. It gives us the will to go on when everything seems to be an uphill battle. Jesus' light inspires us with a desire to work for the greater good by whatever means we have, wearing masks, washing our hands, delaying our holiday gatherings, feeding our neighbors in need, helping the lost and the lonely, and a host of all kinds of other things that we are doing to help protect one another and prevent even more tragedy from happening in the future. There's no way to overstate all the myriads of ways that God is with us in the big and the small of everyday life in this pandemic. Allow me to give you another example of what God with us looks like that could happen anytime, but that takes on special meaning during the pandemic. There's a story I saw on Facebook, maybe some of you saw as well, of a man who went to a Dunkin' Donuts and bought a gift card for exactly $208. Why 208? Well, the man's wife died six months ago, which means that during the pandemic, and likely he was not able to mourn her and grieve her loss in the usual ways. So he thought about uh, doing something special in honor of her. He remembered that before she died, every day she went through the drive-thru at Dunkin' Donuts to buy herself a cup of coffee. So $208 was the amount she would have spent for coffee in that last six months. Having purchased the gift card, the man then told the server at the window to use it to pay for the orders of all the people that came after him until the money ran out. Then, the man and his son, who was with him at the time, sat in the parking lot and watched the people receive this gift and saw firsthand the happiness that it gave them. Now, this is a story of great grace and generosity, for sure. But I have to admit, on reading it, my pre-pandemic self would have been appreciative, but honestly, a little questioning, I guess, because whether that money could have been used for a different or perhaps better purpose. I mean, the people who go to the drive through could probably afford the coffee and donuts they were ordering. What about the people who don't have anything to put on their tables? My mind began to wander. Well, okay, yes, but then it occurred to me, perhaps a sign of the Spirit speaking to me, that there is perhaps more going on here than first meets the eye. Of course, this is an important story about a man honoring his wife and working through his grief through this act of kindness. It's more than a random act of kindness, but a way of uh, leading towards healing and hope. But there's also the goodness that came surely in the time that this man and his son spent in the car together noticing the people who received their gifts, talking with each other about their mother and wife and celebrating the loving memories they had of her even as they made new memories of their own memories without her. That kind of time is precious and life-giving any time we can make room for it. That's a gift of God's gracious presence as well. 
And finally, even most specific to the pandemic, I imagine that this man and his son were seeing people in their cars with their masks off um, as they're in their own bubbles, in their own car. And with their masks off, they could see the smiles of appreciation on people's faces. How long has it been since we have actually seen people smile in public when we've been out and around? On the one hand, I hope it's been a long time, <laughs> But because of masks, but on the same time, it's something that we need and something that we miss. God, as Emmanuel, used what appeared to be a random act of kindness for some, not only to help heal a family, but even more so to become an example of God with us in a way that transcended that parking lot at Dunkin' Donuts. God was with each of the families and co-workers as they received these donuts and coffee and shared in this gift. God used that story to touch us as well, reminding us that love and grace get lived out in everyday moments of our lives. When we live as the embodied hands and feet of Christ in the world, God uses us to bring blessing and hope to others. Our lives here on earth, though limited in days and years, are a gift to the world as we too live out God's promise of love and grace for all in God's love incarnate right here where we are. So if you are looking for a sign that God is still with us today, look no further than God's promises and God's word and the gift of God's sacrament, the holy meal that we will celebrate today, reminding us that God has chosen us and will love us forever. God is with us to bless us and walk with us through all the hills and valleys of life, and just as God said to King Ahaz so many years ago, God says to us today, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your hearts be faint. Jesus is the tangible sign from God that everything is in God's hands for our salvation, for the life and good of the world. Our mission now is then to be God incarnate, to incarnate and embody the love of Jesus in and through us for our world today. Wherever there is need, God's healing and life-giving touch can work through us to restore and renew hearts and minds, and as we focused on most recently, bodies as well. All who need to know the promise and presence of Christ are still with us and for us. May we shine the light of Christ on the hopes and the fears of all those around us so that Christmas will truly be a celebration of God's incarnation, Christ's birth among us for the life of the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you today as those who are well aware of the darkness that surrounds us and our need for your light to come into our world. Help us see Christmas as uh, the celebration of your humanity, of your coming to be born into the world, to live out your promise to be our God and to bring salvation and new life and restoration for all. Help us to see that light, that it shines in our lives, and help us then live that light and reflect it out into the world through the words of our mouths, through the actions of our hands and our feet, that we might share very tangibly signs of your love for those around us. Help us, inspire us, be with us as we do so, that, our, uh, that your love might live through our hearts and into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand with us. like no other your name 
Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. Jesus is shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to say what's your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say but your name. Gathered into one body, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of your, your proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, musicians, lay leaders, vicars, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Embed your word in their hearts. O oh God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all of creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and plants. Strengthen human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. O oh God, for whom we long, Show us your mercy. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. O God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. God of the powerful and of the helpless. You clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need, especially Leo, Connie, Calla, Madeline, Paul, Camden, Angie, Ralph, Jim, Denise, Marlene, Grady, Deb, Lily, Dan, Sharon, Beth, Keith, Craig, Dana, Lee, Justin, Brenda, Caleb, Bentley. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. O God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. We name before you those we remember in our hearts and minds at this time. O God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. God of protection, you weep for the struggles of your creation. As we continue to wrestle with COVID-19 and its effects, remind us that you are here to guide and protect us. Give wisdom to those creating the vaccine and provide resources to spread it widely to all. Give healing to all who struggle with the virus and give peace to the families and friends of those who have lost loved ones during this struggle. O oh God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testified to your radiant love. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. O God, for whom we long, show us your mercy. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Emmanuel. Amen. And now we turn our attention towards the brief order for confession and forgiveness. 
my friends, because it's so hard to wait. It's not easy to live through Advent days. But watch what God, what, watch what God does during this time. God waits for us to turn from our old ways, to find the right path. God waits for us to admit that what we have done and failed to do so that we might be forgiven and graced with new life. So let us approach the one who waits for us. Would you bow your hearts and minds at this time in public confession? And so we come before you, God, waiting, God, it is never easy for us to confess our sins. There are hurts which have caused to our families and friends, which we would like to forget. There are those we believe are impossible to love, and so we don't try. There are people who live on the edge of our society, and we ignore their cries for help. Forgive us, God, who come near to us. When we have lost our way, show us you. Lead us in humility and teach us your truth so we might be able to keep your word revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My friends, God does not remember our sins, but remembers the promise, promises which he has made to us. God does not shame us, but lifts us to new life. Lead us in your hope, O God, and teach us your love. You are the God of our days. We wait for you to come to us. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Amen. And so as we turn our hearts and minds towards communion, all are invited, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the lowest and the least, sinners and saints, to get together in communion. Come find your place here where there is no stranger or foreigner only brothers and sisters in the sight of God. We give thanks because Jesus showed us the way, because Jesus is the way. Jesus was the gift from God for the world. He is called Emmanuel, God with us, and came to save us from our sins. Jesus lived a life of thankfulness and gave his life as a sacrifice for many. We give thanks that he is our Savior, Christ the Lord. And so, my friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So let us pray. God of grace, thank you for this bread and wine and for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. God of hope, fill us with your Spirit today that we might have the wisdom to understand the mysteries of this table and the depth, height, breadth, and length of your love for us. And through this meal, strengthen us to be followers of Jesus, a community of peace in a broken world. We remember Jesus' birth and his presence as God with us. We remember Jesus' life and his love. We remember Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. We remember the resurrection and the promise of life. We remember that we are waiting in hope to see Jesus again. Amen. So as we remember, come, you are invited to the table to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ living in your lives.
Would you please stand? May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. All good. Now please pray with me. Jesus, you truly are Emmanuel, God with us. In this season of hope, may the meal we've shared together nourish us to be your body in the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With the angels in heaven, we join in singing your praises. Glory to God in the highest. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. And now receive this blessing. May God who gives peace make you holy in every way. May Christ Jesus clothe you with salvation and victory. And may the Holy Spirit speak through you with the good news of hope. Go now, for you are chosen and sent in the Spirit. Amen. And now let us go in peace and prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Yeah, you, you are God, you are Lord, you are all.